In this video, I'm going to describe how to program the PIC circuit that you've built. We're going to be using the SNAP programmer. And that's an inexpensive uh, programming solution from Microchip. We'll take a look at our circuit here. Uh, I've got the PIC, um, and it's basically very simple. It's only got one user LED and one user button. Everything else is just the bare minimum to make it work. Um, I've got my SNAP programmer and I'll uh, plug it in over USB and stick it into my uh, long header pins so that it has access to the board. And when I did that, I didn't lose power or anywhere, so um, I know that my circuit seems to be working well. Let's look at the code. So I've opened MPLAB X Studio, uh, the, the IDE. Sorry, it's not really called Studio, it's just MPLAB X. Uh, what we need to do is make a new project and this is a standalone project. We're choosing the microcontroller here, so I'm uh, using the PIC32MX series. And we have to choose the specific PIC, and I'm going to highlight it and type PIC32MX170F, and we're using the 256B. And I'm using a snap to do the programming, and I'm using the most recent version of the compiler, and I don't know, I'll call this homework one. This is where um, the location is going to be stored. If you're in my class and you're saving this to a GitHub file, this should be your GitHub repository slash a folder called homework one. Um, and in there you can give this project whatever the name is. The project's name will be, in this case, homework1.x. It ends in this .x extension, and we'll save as uh, the main project. So when it opens, if there are any other projects open, um, when you hit the, the compile button, this project is now going to be the one that compiles. So I've got a project called Homework 1, and it's totally blank. Each of these uh, internal folders, like source is where the C files would go, and, and header is where the header files would go, things like that, totally empty. So I'm going to right-click on source files and say new C file, and I like to call my first one main, so main.c. Microchip um, puts in some comments here. Uh, I don't like any of that junk, so I'm going to select it all and delete it. And from the uh, ME433 repository, uh, there's a C template, so I'm going to paste in my template. So I don't think it's cheating to, to start with this template. Um, we'll be talking about all of these elements anyway. So the first thing we'll see is that uh, we're including xc.h, so that's uh, all of the uh, symbols and variables and functions that microchip provides, so the names of all the special function registers. And then the uh, attrips.h file, that gets us the ISR for uh, the macro for doing our interrupt service routines. Then the next set here, pound pragma. So pound pragmas are uh, the uh, pre-compiling step. Um, and what it's doing is it's setting these uh, three or four special function registers that I call the special special function registers, um, the dev config bits. These are the bits that are not settable in code. They're only settable by your programming device. So in this case, they're set by the snap. And these are the things that are telling the pick uh, how to run and specifically how fast to run. Uh, they have bits uh, set in uh, the data sheet that we can see. In this version of the uh, IDE, though, we're using pound pragma to set the bits. So there's a bit called debug, and rather than setting a bit or as a one or as a zero, um, we're going to use the word on or off here, where I've put these X's, to determine whether we're using debugging in this project and whether we're using JTAG and things like that. And Microchip kind of hides this documentation in an HTML file that came with the compiler. Um, so something like XC32, the version, docs, config docs. Um, an HTML file specifically for this pick, and we can find, uh, say, like JTAG, and the JTAG has options of on and off whether we want to enable JTAG or not. So I would go to my JTAG, and uh, in this case we're not using a JTAG programmer, that's a, another kind of programmer, um, and if JTAG was on, the two pins that talk to a JTAG programmer wouldn't be available to us in code, uh, kind of block them. So we want to make sure that this is off. So you can see all of these X's in the template. You have to go through and figure out exactly uh, what those values should be. 
And kind of the hard ones are what to do with the oscillator. So the oscillator, which is an 8 megahertz crystal, um, is going to use a, a peripheral inside of the pick called PLL, or phase loop lock. It's going to turn that 8 megahertz into another frequency. So we want the pick to run as fast as possible. With an 8 megahertz crystal, we can make the pick run at 48 megahertz. And the math that goes behind that is that first we have to take uh, 8 megahertz and turn it into uh, something between 4 and 5. So uh, we're going to PLL divide it first from 8 into 4, so we'll divide by 2. Uh, then we will multiply it to get it to be a big number, and then we can divide it again to get the final value. And the final value we're trying to get is as close to 50 megahertz as we can, and with the values that they give us uh, for the possible uh, divs and multiplications here, we can only get to 48. So figure out this is probably divide by 2 to get into the 4 to 5 megahertz range, then we're going to multiply by something, then we're going to divide by something to try to hit 48. And you can go back and look at those tables, look for FBLL. Um, you can just see that there's uh, lots of uh, choices here, but not every possible thing you'd ever want. Okay, once those are set, uh, we can take a look at some of the other code I'm providing. So underscore underscore, um, that's a function that microchip has provided, and it's a function they don't really want you to to, to like mess with. Uh, these are generally functions that have to do with changing special function registers within the CPU core itself. So we're going to turn off the interrupts. We're going to do all of our initializations, um, and then we'll turn on interrupts. At that point, we're ready to kind of like run our code. And the initializations I'm giving um, is that uh, we're dealing with uh, some cache stuff, some white states. Uh, so we're trying to make the pick run as fast as possible. Uh, there's two kinds of uh, interrupts the pick can run. We're going to use multi-vector, meaning like lots of different styles of interrupts. Uh, we're turning off JTAG specifically in the special function register so that it doesn't block the two pins. And then anything that you wanted to do in terms of pins would go uh, somewhere around here. And then in the code, uh, so in the infinite while loop, um, let's say we wanted to read blank LEDs and read pins and stuff, all of that would go in here. And then of course this is the C code, so you could add your own functions, uh, and you could add the prototypes, the prototypes would probably go up here somewhere, and so on. So what do we want this specific code to do? On A4, we have an LED, and on B4, we have a button, and um, the LED when that is uh, a 1, the LED is on, and uh, if we set the bit that controls A4 to a 0, the LED would be off. So that's wired as I guess you would traditionally think it would. The button, though, is wired with a pull-up resistor, so that means that if you were to read it and you got a digital 1, that's unpushed. And if you got a digital 0, that means it was pushed. And that's due to the fact that we're using a pull-up resistor, so we had 3.3 volts uh, to a resistor to our button, and that went to B4. So just a little logic issue there. How do we deal with uh, these two pins in code? Well, we have to tell uh, A4 to be an output pin and B4 to be an input pin, and the TRIS special function register um, sets whether a pin is an input or an output, and if the tris bit is a zero, we're going to be an output, and if the tris bit is one, we're an input. So we want to make uh, tris a position four equal to a zero. And one way we can do that is we could say tris a equals on a big number, specifying that the bit that represents a four uh, is a zero, or we can use this representation tris a and then lowercase bits dot, and then uh, tris a4 equals a zero. And let's take a look at how the IDE helps us when we're doing this. So if I wanted to do that here, I would say tris a bits dot, and rather than uh, looking this up in the data sheet to figure out what exactly the name of that bit is, um, it should right now pop up and say, oh, here are the, all the possible bits inside of tris a. Now the red underline here says you haven't compiled yet, so I don't know what this is yet. So I'm going to go and hit the build button, the hammer, 
and it's going to compile this the first time. And I should now get an error because I left something off. But uh, let's try it now. Just A. And here are all the pins in the port A on this pick. So A4 equals zero. So if you're used to my previous class where we uh, were using a general text editor, it didn't have any of the smart editing techniques. You had to know which bits existed. Um, here it knows because it has access to the files that contain the definitions through xc.h. So I can also say trace uh, b bits dot, and here are all the b pins on this pick. In this case, we're using b4 equals a one. Uh, and then uh, lat controls whether the output pin for a is a one or a zero, and port can be read for if b is currently a one or a zero. And then in our infinite while loop, to do specific kinds of timing, we're going to use underscore cp0 set count and underscore cp0 uh, get count to know what time it is inside of the pick. That's the core timer, a 32-bit unsigned number that is always incrementing inside the pick. And it ticks at half the rate of the system clock, so it ticks at 24 megahertz. So a good way to write some kind of delay would be to say cp0 set count to zero. So we force that counter to go to zero. And then we can say while we uh, cp0 get count, now read that back is less than if I said 24 million. So 24 million is half of the 48 million. So that would be uh, wait exactly one second. So in some, inside of this while loop, I do nothing. And so if I wanted to do wait for half a second, I could take that number divided by two. If I wanted to wait for a tenth of a second, divide by 10, and so on. So this is a cheap way of getting a very accurate um, delay. And the code that I've written, so now uh, this code should compile. Uh, to put the code on, I would hit this downwards green arrow. And we'll see first that we're going to build. Oh, and it's not going to like any of my x's. So I'm just going to go through and temporarily comment them all out. This particular piece of code wouldn't um, run at the right speed, but I would hit the download button. And after building a uh, this message connecting to programmer will appear, and then we'll see some messages about the programmer taking our code and loading it onto the pick. And this code doesn't do anything like I didn't program it to do anything. I'm going to uh, set as a main project my previous project and download that code. So this is our first homework assignment. Take the pick it out so we can see better. That when I push the user button, my LED uh, turns on for half a second, off for half a second, on and off again for half a second. So we get two blinks, one second each. And I will verify that timing with my end scope. So I've taken pin A4 and gone to channel one on the end scope and I've connected their grounds together. And I'll set the time scale on my end scope to uh, 500 milliseconds. So now each horizontal square is half a second. And I can see when I push the button, I get roughly one square. And it should be exactly one square worth because we have very accurate timing now. If this didn't meet half a second, that probably means that it didn't set up my pound pregnancy correct. So that's uh, the reason why we go through the effort of trying to get an accurate representation of the time using our core timer and checking with the end scope to make sure that we set up those pound fragments correctly.